That's a good sound. I've been getting a lot of uh, calls and messages. <clears throat> Had some FaceTime chats. Questions. A lot of folks are kind of wondering <laughs> what time it is. <laughs> you know, the Bible says it's time to awake, O sleeper, and Christ will shine on you. <laughs> I think it is time. It's time to awaken. It's time to get up. This is kind of how I start my day every day. Drinking some coffee and getting into the Word. I think it's definitely time to get into the Word. But really, the question that people ask me has more to do with what is the uh, the time frame. What what is the time according to the prophetic timeline? What time is it? Well. You guys have heard me say this before. I, I believe we are living in the end times. Now, without sounding too crazy, what I want to say is let's let's get into the Word and see what the Word has to say about the end times. This is a fast coffee maker, but uh, sometimes it just doesn't seem quite fast enough. So today we're going to sit down and open the Word. We're going to look at uh, primarily the book of Revelation. We'll look at Matthew 24. We might look into Daniel. But primarily the book of Revelation. Because I think it's important to think about what time it really is. So Revelation starts out, and what we learn as we read it is that this is called the revelation of Jesus Christ. A couple things I, I like to point out here is this, is this is Jesus giving us, unveiling, um, opening up to us what, what is going to happen. And as we read through it, it says that it's given so that the churches we'll be aware, we'll, we'll know, we'll understand, we'll have discernment about how to handle, um, how to deal with things in the end times. Matthew chapter 24, it's kind of a parallel passage with uh, Mark 13 and Luke 21, but but something that's important to note in, in Matthew 24 and in each one of these other passages, um, Jesus says the same thing to his disciples, to his friends. Matthew 24, 4, it says, And Jesus answered them, and, and he said, See to it that no one misleads you. And, and I want to say to you, church, it's so easy to be a person that is misled a person that's led astray. Unless you're a person that stays, number one, in intimate relationship with Jesus. Number two, a person that stays in the Word. You're in the Word. You're familiar with what the Word says. 
You're so familiar with the word that when something that is not of the word is said, man, the red flags go up. So number one, in relationship with Jesus. Number two, in the word. And number three, you're in relationship with other believers. You're talking to other believers. <clears throat> you're in fellowship with other believers. You're discussing things with other believers. You're bouncing ideas off of other believers. You're talking about prayers that you're praying or things that you've read or things that the Lord is putting on your heart. Those three things are so key. Relationship with Jesus. Relationship with the Word. And, and relationship with others. <clears throat> now, a big part of that also is going to be walking in the Spirit. You know, the Bible says if we walk in the Spirit, we will not carry out the deeds of the flesh. And so I want to also encourage you to be that person that's walking in in relationship to the Holy Spirit. You're letting the Holy Spirit lead and, and, and guide and, and inform and, and, and speak to who you are and where you are and how you are. So, so that's important. But again, Jesus says, see to it that no one misleads you. And then he says, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ. And they will mislead many. Now, as we, as we read this, Matthew 24, Jesus, he, he kind of gives really the whole book of Revelation in, in, you know, a relatively short period of time. So Revelation has not been given yet in Matthew 24, but Jesus is answering the question. His disciples say, well, when, when are you going to come back? What, what will the signs be? And so Jesus kind of runs through it. And what I think is as you read Matthew 24 or Mark 13 or, or Luke 21, it, it can be kind of like a transparency. Remember what transparencies were when we were first doing contemporary worship? You know, you'd have the lyrics and you put them on this uh, little transparency projector and they would go up on a screen. Remember that? Before computers and PowerPoint and easy worship, all that stuff. So you take the transparency of Matthew 24 Mark 13, Luke 21, and you lay it over what it says in the book of Revelation. And I think as you do that, what you can find is you can find really kind of an outline that tells you how things are going to go, but also that helps you understand where we really are right now. And that's a good question to ask. Where are we really right now? And so we're going to kind of flip back and forth a little bit here. But I believe, and, and, you know, a lot of people are going to probably disagree with this. A lot of theological and biblical experts are going to disagree with this. But, but let me say to, to, to that, I want you to pay attention to that idea that the experts are probably going to disagree. You see, it was the experts that missed the first arrival of the Messiah. The Bible said where it was going to be, when it was going to be, how it was going to happen, pretty much. And the experts missed it. The Bible even said when the Messiah was going to roll into Jerusalem on what we call the triumphal entry. But again, the experts missed it. And so I want to say, you know, the, the Word of God was not written... And please understand, as I say this, this, it was not written, it was not given under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit for experts. It wasn't, it wasn't given for seminary professors and THDs and all these educated 100-pound brain people. The Holy Spirit moved people of God and inspired and they wrote. But many of these folks that wrote they were simple folks. In the New Testament context, John, for instance, he was a fisherman. Peter, for instance, he was a fisherman. Blue-collar guys. And the Holy Spirit moved and wrote through them to us. 
And by God's design, you don't have to be an expert to understand Scripture. All you have to do is get into it. Get into it and be in relationship with Jesus and be in relationship with others and listen to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And it makes sense. It makes sense. So, so in Matthew 24, Jesus gives this basic timeline. He says some really interesting things um, about what to look for. And, and again, people keep asking me, what time is it? What time is it prophetically? Well, you know, for, for most of my ministry, and I got to have some coffee, hold on. For most of my ministry, whenever I've wrestled with that question, I thought to myself, I think that we are in the stage of the beginning of birth pangs. Now, why would I say that? Because here's what Jesus says in Matthew 24. See to it that no one misleads you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. And you'll be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened, for those things must take place. But that is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. And then in verse 8 it says, But all these things are merely the beginning of of birth pangs. Now, now there's a, a stop there. And then in verse 9, then it says, Then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you, and you will be hated by all nations on account of my name. Now, I want to pause there and think about that. What would, what would create the hating of people because of the name of Jesus? What would create that scenario? I, I've, I've never really been able to answer that. I, I know there's always been a little angst from the world against Christians or when, when we as believers stand up for, for what we think and what we believe and what we know to be true of Scripture. That can create a lot of angst. But what would create a global hating of Christians? When it says, you will be hated by all nations on account of my name, what what would bring that about? And by the way, that follows the beginning of birth pangs. And so again, I've always felt like we were in the beginning of birth pangs. Why? Because that's what Jesus said. But then there's a transition. And, and what is that transition? Well, from famines, and earthquakes, kingdom against kingdom, and wars, and rumors of wars, then right into... They will deliver you to tribulation and they will kill you and you will be hated by all nations on account of my name. And then it says, and at that time, many will fall away and they will deliver up one another and they will hate one another. What would bring that about? And again, what time is it? Where are we really? Well, Let's gonna let's flip over to uh, the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter one is just kind of an introduction where you know we find John setting the stage um, for how he receives this and why he's writing and, and and who is speaking to him. And then then we get into Revelation and and the end of chapter one we start seeing if you have a red letter edition you, you start seeing some letters some words in red, and what that means is these are the words of Christ. So John is receiving a revelation from Jesus, and he's writing it down. He's quoting Jesus, if you will. And, and then we see letters to churches. There's seven letters, and theologically speaking, it's we call it a chiasm, and, and there's no time here for that today. But we have a, a message to Ephesus, and we have a message to Smyrna, and a message to Pergamum. And then we have a message to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. And then once we get past these messages to the churches, and again, these are not just messages to churches then, these are messages to the church, to churches everywhere. And you can still see church types, denominational understandings, and theological orientations described right here in these seven letters uh, of Revelation, pretty much two through three. 
But then we get into Revelation 4, and John begins to describe to us things that he is seeing. And, and one of the phrases that goes on throughout the book of Revelation is, is this phrase, after these things. And so what, what we know is, is that what that means is John is telling us that there's a, there's a progression. So there's this, and then after these things. And then there's this, he describes what he's seeing and what is to come. And then, then he says, after these things. So it gives us a timeline to follow. And, and so we see chapter 4 where he is at the throne of God and he's receiving and seeing and recording. And then we get to chapter 5 and we begin to get a description of, uh, of a sealed book, if you will. A, a book with seals. And, and John realizes there's nobody, there's nobody that's... That's good enough to open up this book. No, nobody can do it except for Jesus, the Lamb who was slain from before the foundation of the world. Jesus is able to break the seals and open the book. And, and I want to emphasize what I just said. Jesus is able to break the seals. Again, the question is, where are we? Well, again, a lot of people are probably going to disagree with this. But I believe right now we are in the seals. In fact, I, I believe that my lifetime, um, let me say this, I, I believe the seals, as, as we get into the, the description of what the seals are, and, and seals were like, um, were like a wax, um, adhered wax to a scroll. And, and, and this describes a scroll or a book, and it's sealed together with seven seals. And so you have to break the seals in order to open the scroll, all right? So Jesus is the one that can break the seals. So here's what I think. I believe that the 20th century, and I know we're in the 21st century now, but I believe the 20th century was that century that we see described in Revelation chapter 6, where we talk about the first, the first seal. And it says, and, and I saw that when the lamb broke one of the seven seals, I heard one of the four living creatures saying, as with a loud voice of thunder saying, come. And I looked and behold, a white horse. Now, I don't interpret this to mean the white horse is Jesus. This is, this is one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, if you will. But listen to what it says. A white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. Now, there's a lot more I could describe here and, and try to explain, but I believe that this is the first half of the 20th century. Then, verse 3, it says, And when he broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come. And another, a red horse went out, and to him who sat on it was granted to take peace from the earth, and that men should slay one another, and a great sword was given to him. Now, neither one of these two characters that we see described here are Jesus. That's not how I interpret this. Here's what I think. I think this is the first and second half of the 20th century. Why? Because it describes conquering and wars and a lot of killing that men should slay one another with a sword. The 20th century, and I'm reading a book right now, and, and I love reading non-Christian you know, Christian books uh, that uh, say exactly what the Bible says. I'm reading a, a non-Christian book right now that's talking about uh, the bloodiness of the 20th century. It's the bloodiest century in the history of man. Nation rose against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there were wars and famines and earthquakes. And I could explain a lot more about that. But let me just leave it at this. I believe the 20th century is the first seal and the second seal. And then when we get to the third seal, it starts talking about economic things. And, and, and it says, and when, when he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature. And by the way, the third living creature has the face of a man. I believe this is a reflection of the spirit of Babylon, if you will, the, the, the spirit of man's ability to do the best that man can do. And, 
and, and the economic lure of uh, wealth and, and uh, the lure of the love of money and things. And, and in fact, as, as this comes to an end, it, it starts talking about things like the value of wheat uh, or barley. And, that, and then it says, and do not harm the oil and the wine. This is setting up, I think, a picture of of capitalism and a contrast against things like communism. But I think it's a picture of the best that man can do economically and the results of that. Okay? So again, here, here's the first, second, and third seal. This is a transition. I believe this is a, a picture of, of what, what we've seen happen let's say in the late 90s and, and, and then on into the first part of the 21st century. And then we get to the fourth seal. And, and I want you to listen uh, to what it says. The fourth seal. And this is, this is a living creature that speaks and, and the fourth living creature is an eagle. has the face of an eagle. And it says, And when he broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come. And I looked, and behold, an ashen horse, or a sickly, pale horse. And he who sat upon it had the name Death. And Hades was following with him, and authority was given to them, Death and Hades, over a fourth of the earth. I want you to think about that for a moment. Authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth. Now, if we read that, and we think about what it says. That's a lot of people. Now, now listen to what it says. And authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword and with famine and with pestilence or disease and by the wild beasts of the earth. Did you hear that? Famine, pestilence, and by the wild beasts of the earth and to kill with the sword. So, so one, thing, one of the things that we see continuing here is we see war and conquering and conflict. Then we see the, the economic aspect and, and, and how that leads to even more war and famine and conflict. But here's what it says. With pestilence and by the wild beasts of the earth. There's authority over a fourth of the earth. Now think of a one-fourth. Is this telling us that there's going to be the loss of one-fourth of the world's population? Is that what this is saying? What are we at? 7.9 billion people right now? So roughly a fourth of that is... Two billion people are going to die as this fourth seal is broken. Now, these, these cover periods of time. Now, now, again, I believe that the first seal and the second seal, that's, that's the 20th century. And I believe that the third seal, the things that I know from the news, the things that I know from history, I believe that third seal is, is the end of the 20th and the beginning of the 21st century. And what we see as this progression moves forward is it gets closer and closer together. It goes faster and faster and faster. And when we get past the seals, it's going to go super fast. In fact, we're given a time frame of seven years before at a certain point, then, then seven years. So there's a lot that's going to happen in a seven-year period. But again, I want to back up here. I want to think with you. Pestilence or disease and by the wild beasts of the earth. I'm reading another book right now. It's, uh, it's about illnesses that, viruses that jump from one species to the next. It's interesting, this deal that we're dealing with right now is a virus 
that jumped from one species to ours. There's a lot of viruses like that, actually. A lot of very scary viruses that's been going on for quite a while. But more and more. Things like Ebola. SARS. And yet right here it says, fourth seal. With pestilence and by the wild beasts of the earth. I think this is talking about those kinds of illnesses or infectious diseases that jump from one species to the other. I believe we are in an age of this type of thing happening again and again and again and again. And, and it's not new. I, I mean, the year I was born, 1968, uh, I believe there was a pandemic uh, of w what was called the Hong Kong flu. But we're going to see more and more of it. And then man, humankind, is going to come up with a solution. Oh, well, let's, let's fix this. Let's, let's control our populations. Let's control our populations and let's force them to behave in certain ways and let's Let's, let's put requirements on them that we can, we can, um, we can monitor and, and uh, we can control and we can make sure that these human beings are not going to, uh, to cause more problems. And so we're going to control them. We're going to, we're going to require them. We're going to force them to behave, to comply, to do certain things for their protection. So what happens when we enter this age of global pandemics and man thinking his best thoughts comes up with a plan to require every human being in order to keep them all safe. To receive a number and a mark so that they can be traced and tracked and controlled. And what happens in an age of pestilence and disease if there's a certain group of people that know that they've been warned in, in advance that there's gonna come a time where they're not gonna be able to buy or sell unless they receive a mark. A mark of the number of the beast. And what happens with this group of people that says, no, we will not bow. We will not bow at the altar science, medicine, and technology. We will not. You see, at that point, that segment of the population becomes not only an enemy of the state, but an enemy of the world. And remember what Jesus said, that we would be hated, believers in him would be hated by all nations because of his name? You see, I think we're in that age of the fourth seal. And, and guess what happens next? Well, again, if you go back to Matthew 24, 9 through 14, there's, a, there's an age of persecution and many will fall away. And what we see with the fifth seal, I believe it's telling us about an age of persecution that is to come. How long is that going to last? I don't know. But here's the thing. I think we've crossed the bridge from the beginning of birth pangs to the next thing persecution being being delivered over to tribulation again not the great tribulation but a time of tribulation that's going to lead to the great tribulation a time of persecution revelation chapter 6 
And it says, and when he broke the fifth seal, oh, let me back up just real quick. And by the way, at the end of uh, verse 8, it talks about pestilence and by the wild beasts of the earth, men will die. I'm reading another interesting book. Again, not a Christian book. This is an outdoor author who, who's writing about the increase in human and wild animal interactions that result in attack. That death from wild beasts of the field and attacks from wild beasts of the field is on the rise. And it has been for some time. Interesting. The Bible says it right here. That men are going to die from disease and from the wild beasts of the earth. And that this time of pestilence and disease is also going to be marked by people killing one another with the sword or with war and with famines. Have you paid attention to the news lately? Processing plants being shut down. Farmers literally having to torch their crops because there's no place for them to sell their food. And now the news is talking about a global food shortage. Here's the word right here, famine. What's next? Well, I don't know, but I know what the Bible says. And here's what the Bible says. The Bible says, And when he broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. You see, this is leading us into a time of persecution where Christians will be killed because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they maintain. And then those very believers who have laid their life down throughout history and in this time cry out, How long, O Lord, holy and true, wilt thou refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell in the earth? Verse 11, And there was given to each one of them a white robe, and they were told that they should rest for a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed, even as they had been, should be completed also. So we're going to go from a, a time of pestilence and disease and death by the wild beasts of the earth and, and, and war and famine. We're going to enter into a season of persecution where believers will be judged and tried. And in fact, if you go back to Matthew 24, it says in verse 10, and at that time, many will fall away and will deliver up one another and hate one another. That means they're going to be turning one another in. And at that time, many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. And because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. You see, now this is describing a societal, structural breakdown. That means things like government and order that we have created is going to be dismantled. There's going to be a lot of anarchy and a lot of craziness, and it's going to be a stage that is now set for a world leader for a world association to step in and say, hey, we can fix this. Trust us. We're the government. That's what's coming. And then what's next? So we have the fourth seal, pestilence and famine and war and disease and the wild beasts of the earth. And then we have the fifth seal, persecution and death. And then we have the sixth seal. And again, this is going to progress. This is going to get more and more rapid. The sixth seal is cataclysm. And now let me, let me look at this with you. And I looked, and when he broke the sixth seal... There was a great earthquake, a massive earthquake. And I think this is indicating all around the world. 
listen to the effects of this earthquake. And there was a great earthquake, and the sun became as black as sackcloth made of hair, and the whole moon became like blood. So, where are we? I think it's time to look up and be watchful. I think it's time for you and I to get into the Word. It's time for you and I to be in right relationship with Jesus. It's time for you and I to be in fellowship with other believers and in relationship with other believers. It's time for you and I to walk by the Spirit. But I also believe that we have crossed the bridge from the beginning of birth pangs into the time of the fourth seal. A time of pestilence and disease and, and of man coming up with a solution. And, and again, the thoughts of man, I don't know about you guys, but my best thoughts apart from God have always led to the worst case scenarios. And from there we get into persecution and from persecution it flows into cataclysm, the sixth seal. And then it's going to go very fast, very fast. What time is it? It's time to awake, O oh sleeper, that Christ may shine on you. It's time for us to be people who get into the word and allow the word to get into us. It's time to look up and be watchful, knowing that our redemption draweth nigh. You know, one more thing I want to say, and this is really going to probably tick a lot of people off. As we read these things, there's some crazy stuff. If, if I'm right, there's some crazy stuff that we're going to go through, that we're going to see. Now, I believe in a rapture. I do. But I'm not sure that I see a pre-tribulation rapture as I read Scripture. At the very least, the church, believers in Jesus, are going to be here through some, some of this difficult time. And here's what concerns me, especially when you read in Matthew chapter 24. It says, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and they will kill you and you will be hated by all nations on account of my name. And at that time, many will fall away. You see, my concern, church, is that we have been so indoctrinated with theology that assures a pre-tribulation rapture. In fact, I, there's a TV preacher, man. He, he almost seems to suggest that if you believe, if you don't believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, that you're going to go through these things. Like, like God's going to do that? He's going to... No. If there's a pre-tribulation rapture, Jesus is going to take us all with him if we trust him. But if there's not a pre-tribulation rapture, here's what we've got to understand. Jesus is going to be with us as we go through whatever we go through. It's time to trust him, and it's time to be a believer that says, God, I'm going to go where you call me to go, I'm going to do what you call me to do. I'm going to be who you call me to be. I'm going to say what you call me to say, no matter what. And as for me and my house, no matter what, I want to be that man of God that doesn't fall away. That doesn't fall away. What about you? Who do you want to be? What do you want to see God do in you and through you? It's time, church, for us to step in to who God has made us to be. Remember what Jesus said his job description was in Luke 19.10? He said, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. It's time for you and I to fulfill that job description that Jesus said was his. Why? Because we are the body of Christ. And the body of Christ is not a dead body. It's a living body. And we have been selected by God for such a time as this. I want you to think about that. If these things that I've described to you from Matthew 24 and, and also from Revelation chapter 6, 
if they're true and they're now, the reality is, is God has chosen you to be on his team at this critical moment in the history of humanity. You're on his team. Not only are you on his team, but you're a starter on his team. I think it's time for you and I to get off the bench and get into the game. Don't be anxious. Don't be worried. Don't be fearful. Just trust. Again, get into a right relationship with Jesus. Get into the word. Stay in fellowship. Walk by the Spirit. And know that what Jesus said in the Great Commission, where he said, Lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the age. You see, right now we have a time to trust him and to lean on him and to rely on him and to call on him. Why? Because he is with us. He's with us. Now, again, this thing that we're facing right now, it's going to pass, but there's going to be another one, another pandemic, and there's going to be precautions put in place to make sure that, oh, that this doesn't happen again, but it's going to continue to happen. Then we're going to come into a season of persecution, then we're going to come into a season of cataclysm. And if you want to read some stuff that's really interesting, read the rest of the book of Revelation. But right now, let's just take a minute and invite Jesus to settle our soul, to come into our lives, and to fill us with the peace that passes all understanding. And so, Father God, right now, we just come before you. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for this time together. We ask you, Lord God, to help our hearts be open and give us understanding, Lord. But most of all, Lord Jesus, let us be people that just trust you and Lord, if there's anybody watching this that's never given their heart to Jesus, I pray that right now, Lord, they would simply say, Jesus, I need you in my life. Come into my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Forgive me, God, for my sins. And help me live for you from this day forward. And Father, in these days of things unfolding, something new every day on the news, I pray, God, for the peace that passes all understanding, that it would just guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus, and that we would find ourselves, that we would find ourselves just walking with Jesus from day to day. God, we need you. We trust you. We surrender our lives to you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. God bless you. Keep on keeping on in Jesus.